solar cooking as an emission-free clean cooking solutions, understanding the challenges and opportunities. So I just first want to just introduce myself. My name is Yabei Zhang. I'm a senior energy specialist, lead uh, the Clean Cooking Fund at SMAP. So we do re uh, organize uh, uh, webinars regularly. So uh, this webinar will be the last uh, webinar of this calendar year. And it's about a topic we are very interested. Um, I'm still waiting for uh, SMAP manager Gabriela Azula to join. But uh, I want to uh, use time maybe quickly to go through agenda so um, to save some time later. So we do have a quite exciting agenda, uh, packed uh, uh, items uh, for this webinar. Um, we will first learn about uh, what is solar cooking, what's the overview of the sector from uh, Solar Cooking Cookers International. Um, from uh, uh, the from Caitlin Hughes, the executive director of uh, SCI, and then we will learn a few uh, cases experience from our practitioners, and then we will open up for uh, discussions, and uh, we have invited our regional casting leaders, as well as our client countries. It's very uh, great to see Stephen from um, Brenda, and I hope that uh, um, Paul from Kenya will also join. They are the champion and experts in the countries. And then we'll also uh, have our uh, testing from the World Bank to understand, to reflect they are uh, thinking about uh, solo cooking, how to integrate into the bank operation, what are the challenges, opportunities, and then the way forward. And then we will also open up to, uh, to the audience. So meanwhile, please do feel free to put your questions in the chat box, and we can either also join the Q&A sessions or just answer through the, the chat. So I see it, it's Abrela here. Yeah, I know that uh, we have we were having another unit meeting. Okay, how about let's get started. So when she joined, uh, be great to to have uh, uh, her. Uh, perspective your words about uh, her take of uh, uh, solar cooking. So without um, further ado, I want to hand over to Caitlin, the executive director of Solar Cookers International. Thank you, and thank you so much to SMAP and the World Bank for this opportunity. We're very excited. Um, and I just want to check if our slides are showing up. There we go. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you again for this opportunity. I am Caitlin Hughes. I'm the Executive Director of Solar Cookers International. And next slide, please. So there are hundreds of different types of solar cookers. And here are a few basic categories. But first of all, what is a solar cooker? It's a thermal device that collects and absorbs direct sunlight and retains heat to cook food or pasteurize water. So there's reflective panel cookers, box ovens, parabolic reflectors, evacuated tubes, Fresnel mirrors and Fresnel lenses, as well as institutional cookers, which we'll get to hear more about from Deepak, one of our global advisors. Um, all of these different solar cookers have different advantages in terms of cooking temperatures, capacity, portability, um, and that's part of the beauty of the solar cooking sector is the wide diversity in it. Next slide, please. So who is Solar Cookers International? We are the nonprofit leading the solar cooking sector since 1987. We've identified over 4 million solar cookers worldwide, 
with the capability to cook over 7 billion meals with solar thermal. And our mission is to improve human and environmental health by supporting the expansion of effective carbon-free solar cooking in world re regions of greatest need. Next slide. So how do we do this? Because we are working to address a challenge that affects about 3 billion people or about a third of the world's population. And so we figured out three main ways where we can impact this. And that's through advocacy, research, and building capacity. So for example, through building capacity, we facilitate information sharing with solar cooks and advocates, with our hundreds of collaborators, like Sun Buckets, with our global advisors, like Deepak Gadia, with organizations like the World Bank and the World Health Organization, and with government leaders, like the ministers we have on the call today. SCI does this through many different ways, including webinars like this, and other ones that we've organized to share information about the solar cooking sector within and beyond. Conferences like the sixth SCI World Conference, which we were able to have in India with the help of our global advisors. Uh, incredible team organizing it there. So thankful for that opportunity to showcase solar cooking to our hundreds of collaborators all, the, all around the world. We also do this through United Nations events and our consultative status at the United Nations. For example, Solar Cookers International was able to represent the sector at the recent United Nations Climate Change Conference in Scotland. We also do this through online resources like the Solar Cooking Wiki, which has about 1800 pages of information freely available and automatically translatable into 46 different languages and more. Next slide, please. So we are encouraging countries to include solar cooking in their official plans. And this opens up the opportunity for more resources, more support, and more opportunities. Uh, so we've seen some really exciting progress in terms of this. For example, we've been tracking nationally determined contributions, or NDCs, and these are countries' official plans to address climate change. We've been seeing more countries, including mention of cooking or cook stoves, in their NDCs, which is really important because it is an important factor in addressing climate issues. So we've seen 66 countries now mention cooking or cook stoves in their NDCs, 25 of which state an explicit interest in non-polluting cooking fuels. Of course, which solar cooking is the cleanest cooking, so that's very exciting. And kudos to Somalia for specifically mentioning solar cooking. Solar cooking is such an important, important part of the climate discussion because one simple solar cooker can save a family from burning one ton of wood in a year. So think about that multiplied on the scale of about 3 billion people cooking over open fires and the impact is significant. Next slide, please. So when countries do include solar cooking in their official policies, we like to officially recognize them because it sets a great example for other countries. For example, recently, Solar Cookers International awarded the Order of Excellence to the Republic of Kenya for including solar cooking in their voluntary national review. Uh, and this is how countries track progress in achieving the sustainable development goals. And solar cooking positively impacts all 17 sustainable development goals. The Order of Excellence recognizes the most outstanding people and organizations whose sustained efforts have contributed most to empowering people to cook food and pasteurize water with solar energy. So congratulations to Kenya, and we look forward to many more countries joining that. Next slide, please. So as I said, we're encouraging more countries to include support for non-including cooking in their official policies like their NDCs. And to help encourage that, we've actually created these impact sheets. So there's one for each country. And what it does is it shows the number of solar cookers that we have identified, the estimated impact on that in terms of carbon dioxide emission reductions, the percent of the population that's cooking with non -pollute or with polluting fuels, and then the opportunity for impact in terms of environmental and health cost savings, because cooking with polluting fuels is really expensive. There's definitely a human cost as well as an environmental cost. And so we've created these to encourage more investment in solar cooking around the world. Because that funding is key for scaling solar cooking, since some of the world's most disadvantaged people have the most to gain from solar cooking. So we very much look forward to continued collaboration with the World Bank through opportunities like this and hopefully even more. Thank you again. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, so we know that the solar cooking has a lot of up advantages. It's emission free, it's clean, completely renewable. But on the other hand, 
somehow the adoption rate, the penetration rate is fairly low. So in most of developing countries, the adoption of solar cooking as a primary cooking solution is less than 0.05%. So why, why is that? Um, I remember that I had uh, um, watched uh, Dr. Uh, Deepak's recording a, a few months ago, and I was very impressed by the talk because uh, he particularly talked about a few pain points of solar cooking and how to uh, overcome those challenges. So that's why I, I, I certainly told to our team, but I think it's also be great to learn directly from uh, Dr. Pick, but Deepak about your personal journey, your experience of promoting clean uh, solar cooking. So yeah, floor is yours, um, Dr. Deepak uh, Gadia, and uh, he's the global advisor for Solar Cooker International, and also a manufacturer, entrepreneur. Uh, I think you have a number of uh, titles, <laughs> I will not list uh, <laughs> uh, everything, but the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, Kathleen, for giving the brief introduction of different types of solar cookers. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of walk you through the journey of uh, my, uh, how I got into solar and how it has evolved. And it will give you uh, what uh, Judy said about the challenges one faces and how we overcame that. So next, please. So uh, it's both me and my wife, we studied in Germany and uh, we were invited back to our country by our prime minister. And we had both studied high technology. My wife had done a PhD in genetic engineering I had done my engineering in process and environmental engineering. And we thought that we can come back to India and help with hype technology. But fortunately, we met a German lady, a wise old German lady who told us that what India requires is not uh, high technology, but appropriate technology. We did not believe her at that time and thought that, oh, she's an old lady and the generation gap. But after coming back to India, and I came to India after 10 years, I realized that India had uh, two different Indias altogether. There were 30% of the population which had all access to all type of new technologies, but 70% of the large population was still living the way it was living before 50 or 100 years. And so, and uh, we were shocked to see that uh, government was uh, pursuing the policy of economic growth at a cost of ecology. And having lived and worked in Germany, we realized that you cannot do that. And we were shocked to see the deforestation happening. And then we also saw that for three years in the place where we had shifted, uh, that is Baroda, they had, there were no rains. And we could directly connect that uh, the rains were not coming because of deforestation. So that is how we got into solar cooking. We said, we need to address this problem. We had started an NGO called Ecocenter ICNIR, and we decided to take the problem of deforestation and solve it because it, and we all know that deforestation is linked to all uh, type of uh, uh, environmental issues. And then we realized that 50% uh, of the world population, not just Indian population, even now in 2021, cooks on open fire. 3.2 million women and children die because of the smoke in the kitchen. So we said, how can this be going, uh, this can continue? And cooking is something so simple. So maybe there is a technology but which people do not know about. We looked around. Next, please. And then we came across a technology called box cooker, uh, which was being promoted in India for the last 50 years. A very, very cost effective technology, uh, very simple. It's just like a, a box which is insulated with a glass cover on the top and glass has the property it allows the light to go in but does not allow the heat to come out and then because the box is insulated the temperature rises to 140 degrees centigrade and rice dal vegetable bread whatever you are kept in there gets cooked so we thought wow this is a technology maybe people do not know about it so when we started promoting it uh, we very quickly learned that a lot of people had a box cooker but they were not using it because it was not doing what they wanted they wanted a cooker which could cook fast. They wanted a cooker which could cook all items. And with box cooker, you could not fry. You could not make the chapati with the Indian bread. Uh, <laughs> so we realized that if the technology had to succeed, you have to do what people want and not force upon the force of people to just accept what we have. So luckily, uh, while in Germany, I had a friend called it Dr. Dieter Seifert who was working with me. And he had a technology which offered that. Can I have the next slide, please? 
So this is how uh, which, uh, we got access to this technology called parabolic concentrator, which is nothing but a, like a, a dish antenna where all the sunlights are reflected at one point. And because you are concentrating the sunlight, you have a very high temperature, 250 degrees centigrade or above. And as you can see here, the lady has put a cooking vessel painted black to absorb all the incoming sunlight. And because of the high temperature, she's able to cook very quickly. She's able to fry, she's able to make chapatis. And we said, great, now we have a technology what people wanted, so it will spread. <coughs> but very quickly we realized, or we reached the glass ceiling, and we realized that uh, the cooker, we thought it was very cheap. It was costing about $100. But uh, unfortunately, India is a poor country, and so are many developing countries. And $100 is a lot of money for the poor people. It is sometimes two to three months salary. So the people who needed the technology could not afford it. And people who could afford it, the middle class and the rich, they did not want to use it. So we tried to emotionally blackmail the rich, saying, why don't you use it so you become a role model and the poor may be inspired to use a solar cooker. And this lady said, you know what, Deepak, why should uh, we go into the sun? Why can't you bring a technology where the sun comes to the kitchen? Because if you, you, you all men sit in the comforts of your air conditioned offices, we also want to cook in the comfort of the kitchen. And then that <coughs> gave us the idea that if you were able to do that, then maybe the middle class will adopt it and then it would percolate to the uh, low, uh, low, uh, lower class uh, people. So again, I went back to Dr. Seifert and he said he did not have that technology, but he had a friend called Wolfgang Scheffler who had the technology. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, he introduced us to Wolfgang Scheffler and Wolfgang Scheffler, uh, who is an Austrian but living in Germany, had developed a parabolic concentrator where he kept the uh, reflector outside and reflected the sun, uh, sunlight into the kitchen through the small opening on the north wall of the kitchen. And then he had a secondary reflector below the cooking vessel, which would deflect the light onto the cooking vessel. And then you could see now the lady can cook in the cloth of the kitchen. And we were very happy. We thought, wow, now we have the technical solution. Now we have done what people wanted. Now it should work. But in the heat of excitement and our, our being techno, uh, technocrat, we just forgot that it is not just about Functionality is also about affordability. The cooker, which was costing $100, was costing more than $1,500. So <laughs> even the rich who uh, wanted to use a solar cooker said, no, we want to use solar cooker, but not at such a high cost. And that uh, sort of forced us to rethink and we realized that the cooker uh, may not work for domestic cooking, which was our market, but we had already started our company called Gardia Solar because we had to fund our NGO activities. And we said, uh, to run the company, we need to have business. So why don't we change the focus? And instead of offering domestic cooking, we can offer community cooking. So we increase the size of the parabolic concentrator to 10 square meter. And here you can see two dishes of 10 square meter reflecting light through the opening in the kitchen. And they are cooking uh, 200 meals. This was for a midday meal program for the government school. And this is how we started offering community cooking systems. Uh, to be able to do that, uh, of, uh, the dishes had to be a bit more complex. You had to have a, a system with a stationary focus, which was the uh, unique part of uh, Mr. Wolfgang Scheffler technology. We also had to have a tracker so that the dish moves along with the sun like a sunflower. <coughs> and uh, we could afford to do that. Any other next slide? And then one day we re received an inquiry from an uh, NGO. Uh, called Brahma Kumari, and they wanted to have a solar cooking system to cook for 1,200 people. So we offered them these 12 dishes with, because when, with each dish you can cook for about 100 people. And they said, okay, why don't you buy 12 parabolic dishes or Scheffler dishes, we call them, concentrators. And they said, no, we don't want uh, 12 dishes uh, having 12 cooking places. Can you not reflect light only at one point and only have one cooking vessel? Because otherwise we require a very large kitchen. We have 12 cooking vessels and uh, that was not possible. So we said, okay, what can we do? And this is where we had to innovate. And then we suddenly realized that if you want to cook, you are actually cooking, not with the sunlight, but you're actually cooking with the heat content in the sunlight. So basically, <laughs> we don't need to bring the sunlight into the kitchen. We bring, need to bring the heat in the kitchen. And this is how uh, we developed the world's first solar steam cooking system, where we placed the system in the terrace. And as you can see here, there are multiple dishes reflecting light onto a uh, water tank, uh, we call it receiver or a heat exchanger. And because of the high temperature of 500, 550 degrees centigrade, the water starts boiling and becomes steam. And the steam generated on this, this 106 parabolic dishes here, 
goes into the kitchen, which is on the ground floor, four floor below, and it cooks 30,000 meals per day. So this was the world's largest solar steam cooking system for a temple in South India, uh, cooking 30,000 meals per day. And we said, wow, that's the world's biggest, and we would never ever, ever repeat it. But India is an amazing country. We went and broke our own record. Next, please. <laughs> so this is at present the world's largest solar steam cooking system, which we have supplied also to a temple in, uh, uh, near to Bombay or Mumbai in Maharashtra. And uh, this cooks 50,000 meals per day. So here you see the technology kept on evolving from seven square meter, we went to 10 square meter from 10 to 12.5, and these are 60 square meter dish. Now we don't require two dishes reflecting light onto the uh, heat exchanger, but a single dish onto a single uh, receiver in its focus. And here we have seven three dishes. I would not go into the technology part of it much. I want to basically share uh, how uh, the technology needs to be adapted to meet the requirements. And uh, we became the world's largest company offering solar steam cooking systems to temples. We then diversified and expanded the market. We started supplying to industrial canteens. Next, please. So this is a system installed for IBM in uh, Bangalore. And uh, here you can see the system is not placed on the terrace, but it is placed on a structure because this is a parking place and they wanted to park the car below because uh, this is a this building is a parking lot. And so we not only had to adopt the technology, but we also had to adapt to the local conditions. Next, please. And this is the world's highest solar steam cooking system. This is installed in Kashmir at about 10,000 feet or 3,300 meters. And this is for the Indian Army. We are very proud of it uh, that we could manage to make the man in the green to go green. You know, means uh, Indian soldiers wear green dresses. So we say the man in green go green. And the best part of this was that it, this photograph sort of removed the misconception a lot of people had because a lot of people said, oh, solar system will work when it is hot. What, what will happen in winter? What will happen in minus temperatures? And here you uh, can imagine in, uh, at 10,000 feet in Kashmir, it is minus 15, minus 25 degrees centigrade. But a solar system still works because the solar system <laughs> works on irradiation, DNI, we call it direct norm irradiation, and not it has nothing to do with ambient temperature. Next, please. And uh, initially, we started uh, to pr uh, protect the environment. And then, of course, people brought it because it was saving them money. But then this is where suddenly uh, the statistics which I spoke about earlier became very clear to me where I said 3.2 million women and children die every year because of the smoke in the kitchen. And initially, we could not imagine because we have seen people cooking on LPG or on electrical cookers. But uh, for the first time, we saw this was the Indian Army kitchen. And they were cooking with uh, diesel uh, fire uh, burners. And you can see all the smoke, the soot and all. In the same army kitchen, once it was converted to solar steam cooking system, you can see it became very neat. It became very clean. It was uh, having no pollution. Uh, you, you, they could use stainless steel vessels. They could cook very quickly. And of course, they could save money. Next, please. And then... <laughs> We faced the challenge that, okay, it's possible to cook with solar energy when the sun is there, but what about cooking when the sun is not there? And what about being also able to make chapatis or uh, Indian bread? Because now we were only doing boiling or we were steaming the product. So you could do rice, dal, lentils, uh, that is rice, lentils, vegetables, boiled milk, soups, but we couldn't fry, we couldn't make chapatis. So we again then modified that technology and instead of now generating steam, what we do is we circulate uh, oil into the loop uh, so the sunlight is reflected onto the tank in which uh, the oil is being circulated. The oil te temperature rises up to 300 degrees centigrade. And you can store the oil into an insulated tank. And you can uh, use that oil again to heat uh, at night when there is no sun. You know, and because of the high temperature, you could also fry, you could make chapatis. <coughs> so friends, important is that we need to keep on evolving and keep on meeting the needs of the client. You know, it's in the end, just saying that this is what we have, take it or leave it, it's not going to work. Next, please. And uh, then the ch uh, challenge we started facing was that uh, to install such, such large uh, community uh, institutional cooking systems, you require a lot of space. And uh, space is a premium, you know, because uh, all these uh, institutions are either in industrial area or they are temples and they have no space whatsoever. So we have now started working uh, with an Australian technology of Sunrise CSP. We have, we have brought in a technology called Big Dish which is a 520 square meter, one dish parabola. 
and uh, with that we are able to do what we had uh, we could do with 100 shuffler dishes so the efficiency has gone up the cost has reduced uh, by half and then we require only one third the space area so it's like going vertical instead of horizontal you know just like in, in a horizontal village you can have only 100 houses but in a multi story building you can have all that 100 flats in one building so very simple solution uh, uh, it is uh, very easy to manufacture and install it is made with factory in the field uh, so this is the future. We see that uh, the future is going to be domestic cookers, but at the same time, perhaps for com large communities, we can have centralized kitchen where we can actually pipe steam into hundreds of households, or we can have hot oil circulating into hundreds of households uh, during day and night. So instead of everyone owning up that uh, technology and operating and running it, it could be a, a, a stakeholder who is installing the system and supplying the heat for cooking and for all of the applications. Next, please. So this is another application which uh, we had developed uh, because we suddenly realized that we are always supplying only heat, but why, why can't we also not do cooling? So this was India's first solar air conditioning plant where we are using the heat of the sun to do cooling. So uh, as our NGO Munisha Ashram where I live, we have replaced this boiler, which was a wood fired boiler, consuming about 1000 ton, uh, 1000 kilogram of wood per day. Uh, with our 100 shuffler dishes and now uh, they generate steam and with the steam we go to a technology called vapor absorption chiller chill the water the chill water goes to the hospital and cools the 300 bed hospital so solar cooking uh, so a solar concentrator does not only do cooking they can also do cooling next please <coughs> and so i talked about cooking i talk about cooling but here it's a very unique application we are working on called cremation as you may know in india we are large population of Indians are Hindus and Hindus, they don't like to be buried. They like to be burnt. And for every body to be burnt, we require about 200 to 300 kilograms of wood. So we said, no, why can't we do it with solar energy? So this is the world's first solar crematorium being installed at Munisio Ashram. It's a hybrid system where in case the sun is not there, it works on biogas. So it's a car carbon neutral solution. So once you have a technology, you can offer integrated solution. So we started with cooker, but then started, uh, now started offering process heating, process cooling, cremation, dehydration, wastewater evaporation. Next. So this makes that makes the business sustainable. And uh, this is my last slide. Uh, what we realized in 30 years of my uh, working in the field of pro manufacturing and promoting solar cooker was that technology alone is not sufficient. I started uh, with my challenge which I faced was that people who needed the technology could not afford it. And people who could afford it they do not need it because government offers them LPG or electricity and they are rich enough. They don't need to uh, add up to this technology so they can continue the way they are cooking. So how do we bring it to the last mile? And uh, initially we offered microfinance because we heard of Dr. Mohamed Yunus who got Nobel Prize for his concept of microfinance where you give a soft loan to the poor and they can afford it. But very quickly we learned that microfinance alone would not help because people had to replace something which was free. For a villager, they just collect wood from a uh, forest nearby, so it's free for them. They don't care about the environmental destruction they do because for them, they come first. Their survival is more important. So they say, no, we don't want a solar cooker in microfinance because why should we replace something which is free with something where we have to pay every month? So <coughs> we developed a concept or a business model where we say you pay from your profit, not from your pocket. So we gave them microfinance. But then they were to pay back not from their pockets, but they were to pay from their profit. And so we taught them how to make bread, biscuit, jalebi, gartia, pakoras, the Indian items. And they make money out of it. So, so solar cooking is not just for cooking, but also for income generation. And they were very happy to pay back the money because they are paying from the profit and not from the pocket. So uh, I'm thankful that World Bank has come into it. Solar Cooker has been, uh, Solar Cooker International has been promoting it for a long, long time. I was also on the board of the SCI. We have been working for last 30, 35 years to promote. Unfortunately, we have seen our highs and lows. In India, we had the world's largest solar cooking program. It was subsidized. The cookers were given at 0% interest rate. But all of a sudden, government has reduced, removed the subsidy. And uh, it has given the subsidy to photovoltaic because government wants to uh, save, uh, have, want to have numbers. And I think it's a wrong thing to do because it's not about just clean energy. It's about energy which will tra transform people's life, which will protect environment, which will create jobs. And solar cookers are a perfect way, are the low-hanging fruit. And I'm very glad that World Bank is taking up on it and learning from uh, stakeholders 
to find out how they can be involved and how we can all work together to spread this technology. Thank you very much. And uh, I would be glad to uh, share with you this PowerPoint and also any other questions, answers you may, you may require. Yes, Krishna. Thank you very much, uh, Deepak, for sharing your, your journey. Because that's, I think, exactly I mean, for me too. It's quite interesting to see that how you pick that uh, technology evolves based on the client needs. And you have talked about how to move uh, uh, solar cooking outside to inside, right? Because that's often we see people want to cook inside, not directly under the sun. And then how to move from household level to institutional level. Now we know that for schools, military, hospital, there are large demand of cooking. And then how to combine cooking, not beyond cooking, right? Not only cooking, but actually use of heat um, for air conditioning, for sterilization, etc. <laughs> and eventually it's about how to gain profit from cooking. I think that's exactly point on the affordability side. It's often the 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 biggest barrier we we see when promote clean cooking. Why? How to convince uh, a household to to drop a uh, cost free, although it's polluting, but it's just to do not pay anything for yeah. food. Two, something is clean, nice, modern, but they have to pay. So to to connect that uh, uh, income generation productivity use is the key. Again, that in order to scale up such kind of models, we probably need to dive into more about okay, the financial arrangement, the cost comparisons, what are the key barriers during implementations. I hope that we can have such a discussion later, especially to to learn from our um, past teams at the World Bank to say how why we not consider. This technology and also from our client in, in Rwanda and, and Kenya to see how do they view this uh, technology. Um, I do see our uh, manager, um, Gabriela, joined. So, uh, Gabriela, I, I don't know if you, you want to um, give a few words about uh, this uh, the topic of solar cooking. Thank you, Javi. I'm trying to un unlock my video. <laughs> Thank you. And I actually, I'm, I'm uh, the reason why I joined this, this BBLs and, and webinars is because I, I'm also uh, very interested in learning about the topic. And uh, everything you've said and presented is very interesting to me. Uh, uh, so I mean, really in a learning mode, but um, there is, there is no, uh, doubt that anything that has to do with uh, reaching out more people with uh, innovative technology, solar in particular, and clean cooking, it's going to be really the bread and butter of our operations at the bank. So, so this is really uh, just learning about the frontier solutions, I think is important. So, so that's, that's all I can say, uh, Jave, but uh, also to, I like to thank all the participants because the, this is the perhaps most important topic that we have in ESMAP in the Energy Access Agenda. So anyways, I'm ha happy to learn from your experience. Thank you, Gabriela. I think we're all here to come to learn. <laughs> and uh, the, 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 the overview of the sector, the continued evolution, technology advance on the ground experience. So next, I want to uh, introduce uh, um, another uh, speaker we have uh, um, some bucket. Um, again, it's it's a uh, it's something I learned uh, about two, two to three years ago when Bruce visited us and talk about this some bucket. It's, it's quite different in a way. But my understanding of traditional like in terms of solar cooking. So uh, we actually have some small expedition as part of our energy week learning series. And this time I want to learn more about any updates over the past two years and uh, also hope more people learn about this, this new way of using solar energy for cooking. Um, so we have um, Bruce and uh, Hava from uh, Sun Bucket. So the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Thank you, Yabe and Jingyi and Gabriella very much for uh, inviting us and for hosting and organizing this important conversation. We at Sunbucket certainly uh, feel privileged to be a part of this and uh, I appreciate you including us. Um, Sunbuckets aims to serve those who are energy impoverished and we arrived at our cooking solutions using uh, user-centered research and development design. That is, we traveled around the world and, and asked cooks and users questions like how they cook and where they cook and when they cook, and we discovered several of those pain points that you mentioned, Yabe, and, and several of the things that Deepak learned too in his many years of experience with this, and that people want to cook uh, inside, and people want to cook at night, which is a challenge for solar cooking. And we learned that people wanted to cook using their, their uh, own cooking utensils and culturally appropriate cooking methods, like cooking the bread that Deepak talked about. And so this all pointed us toward developing this user-centered approach that includes energy storage. The key for what we're doing at Sunbuckets is collecting thermal energy and storing it. So either in a portable format or in a stationary format so that users can cook at night uh, when they want to and inside their homes or wherever they like to cook and using their utensils. Um, so for us, storage is the key. I served at, at Sunbuckets for several years. Uh, I stepped away from the day-to-day -day activities um, a few years ago, and so I've invited Ahaba Zarensky. Ahaba is the CEO of Sunbuckets to uh, share a brief presentation. So Ahaba, it's, it's all yours. Thanks, Bruce. Um, and as Bruce said, it really is an honor for us to, to be here. Um, we at Sunbuckets are disrupting the market. Let's put it as simply as that. We're, put it, we're disrupting the market in terms of creating energy impoverished, uh, sorry, energy independence. Um, we not only, in addition, our, our core value started just for the energy impoverished, but also considering that the disasters that are being created as a result of climate change that I'm based in, uh, I'm currently based in Vancouver. We just, Vancouver became two weeks ago an island where um, massive storms blew out bridges and uh, basic supplies weren't able to come in because there was massive flooding. This is not something that's rare to Vancouver. This is something that is happening globally on a massive scale. And solar cooking is both, um, and some buckets is disrupting the market for energy independence, both for the health reasons and the climate reasons, as well as, that, as disaster uh, preparedness disaster preparedness. We're also uh, disrupting the market as a result of our new economic model. Um, and as I originally came uh, to some buckets as someone who uh, was in charge of strategic partnerships and I met Yabe about three years ago as she, as, uh, she noted um, and was constantly trying to think of how to work with the World Bank and how to think uh, how to work with various institutions, and that's all important. Um, but about a year and a half ago, I became CEO, and something interesting happened. Grants got delayed. And when you're trying to actually be both user based and have customers, you can't answer your customers by "I'm sorry." The grant was delayed. USAID hasn't gotten it together to bring in, in the cash or whatever it may be. Oh, I, I didn't see what happened in the chat there, but um, anyhow, so we um, over the past several months have have pivoted to being only um, dependent on the basic market. We are completely financial, uh, financially sustainable based on consumer uh, purchases. Now, it's very helpful that I happen to be, even though I live in uh, Vancouver, which is quite a, um, uh, a high income city, I am the basic market. Why? Everyone who knows me knows the first thing that you'll know about me within the fat in the first five minutes of knowing me is that I have two little kids. I have a four and a half year old and I have a two and a half year old. I was, I had planned this to come to this meeting at eight o'clock. My kids leave for work for school at eight o'clock. What are you talking about? 
And then I got an email about three days ago for a voice check or for, a, for an audio check, can you come in 15 minutes early? So of course I'm talking to my husband and I'm saying, okay, they have to run out the door and I have to run back in, but I also have to cook them breakfast or my husband does, yeah? So there is a certain language that mothers speak globally. And that is we have to deal with hungry, uh, hungry children and quickly. Why? Because otherwise nothing else can happen in our lives. This, this is the sun bucket. Slides, please. If you can go to the next slide. Um, we're actually gonna go to, yep, keep going until I keep going. One more, I think. And one more. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so I think you can all see me still. I, um, first of all, what does sun buckets do? It charges on a stand on a on a parabolic dish. As Ruth said, it stores the energy that is being heated. The, and then you can take it off, bring it inside, and currently within six hours, use that heat to cook a meal and put it back on to store. The reason I don't love this picture here in this slide is because it always makes me being the, the basic consumer, I feel like, you know, I've landed on another planet looking at a parabolic dish and feel like it's some like Martian instrument. But I do want to emphasize that the, the product is this. This is the technology. It is portable. It is hot on the black part, but there is a cover. There is a thermometer um, that you can tell at what degree that you're cooking. And soon within R and D, there will be an adjustment in the thermometer so that you can adjust it as you would as you would fire. Bruce has always said um, that uh, Bruce has always said that we have no competition except for fire, A and that is true. Um, that is true. Let's go back to the second slide, please. Um, perfect. Thank you. Um, so first of all, Dr. Deepak, it is an honor and a pleasure to meet you. What you are doing is phenomenal and I did not know about it until this presentation and I look forward to working with you on um, global projects. I think on an institutional level, what Dr. Deepak is doing is revolutionary. I think what in a household level, what Sunbuck is doing is the answer. I also want to, um, push back on something that was said. Collecting with firewood is not free. Collecting with firewood is the cause of rape and sexual assault for women who live the comfort and the security of their communities to find that. More than that, it is at the cost of their education. It is at the cost of their capacity to build businesses. And as a, a woman who is, if, I, if that were my option, I would know very violently that that is not free. It is probably at a greater cost than just giving cash. Uh, let's go down, um, let's go down two more. So, these are what's not working. We know that. Keep going. Yeah, I think we already received questions. I think you have a slide about the cost. <laughs> yeah, great. Amazing. Uh, thank you for checking the questions. I, so I, even though I, you know, there are stereotypes about what moms can do. Multitasking is not one. So when I'm speaking, it's hard for me to actually read at the same time. So if someone, uh, I'm assuming there is a Q and A in which my presentation will end and then we'll get questions. Um, so, so I'll relate to those in the Q and a, or at least, uh, the team that's moderating will help me do that. This was our 1st, some buckets, uh, user. Um, Arby is, uh, we, we started really in a refugee camp. I mean, we started in multiple locations, but with the help of. Again, when we were about, uh, 2 years ago, really at the incubation stage. We were piloting user based testing at a refugee camp in Kenya, um, in Kakuma, and this was our first user. 
the demand was a lot more than the grant provided for. And as a result, we created a pay as you go system where you pay uh, a couple of cents per day and you're able not only to have the sol some buckets cooker, but also lighting that's associated, uh, lighting that's also based out of off of the off of the the solar energy that's given by the sun bucket. Again, because it's not only a cooker, but it's also a thermal uh, solar heat storage device. You can use that energy for a lot of different things, and we've actually provided a lot of different products that ranged for from only cook stoves to actually. Uh, entire entertainment systems. <laughs> um, one of the interesting things that that we had learned, even amongst the the most poor in the refugee camp, is we thought people would want the cheapest thing, and indeed they actually wanted the most expensive thing because they wanted the luxury of having those things that they had uh, always dreamed of. Okay, so if we go to the next slide. Yeah, and maybe one more. One more. Thank you. Okay, so what is the business model? The business model is, first of all, um, in some location, it, this is a, a very, very, very important point. Countries are different. We know that countries are different, but our business models need to be different in the different countries. And so one of the business models we have is the pay as you go system, um, where you pay between 19 cents and a dollar a day, and you can own the sun bucket within two to five years, as well as the entire, if you, if you buy just, a, um, if you buy just a solar cooker, it's within two years. And then there's a conversation of, um, of, you know, the, the paying for LPG in perpetuity or just ending your, ending your payments at the end of two years. And if you want something that's more expensive, um, it's the highest end, which is quite expensive, but it's a dollar a day for five years. Okay, um, that's one model. Another model that is quite exciting, and I, I encourage everyone to just follow some buckets in, in the upcoming quarter, is we're about to launch into Uganda with a, um, a partnership with uh, the universities and vocational centers in which all of the um, labor costs are, um, are not only local, but we've created a self-assembly kit. And so we're working with the government and vocational schools in Uganda to create um, and sell self-assembly kits. And we expect about a thousand units per day to be sold by Uganda. And for the employment, uh, for some buckets itself to, to create um, uh, exponential employment in Uganda. And again, I encourage everyone to just follow, uh, be in touch um, and you can be in touch with me directly, Bruce directly. Um, we're not as good as we should be on social media. Um, so I, I wouldn't advise following there, but certainly in direct contact, we are, we are quite good. Um, so about a thousand, we, our numbers are about a thousand units a day that we're gonna sell. And we're going to be working very closely with the Ugandan government um, as well as vocational centers. And there um, we're not only promoting exponential usage of solar, but also employment at the same time. Um, the last point, the last business model is the most difficult one because the market, ironically, is the hardest to penetrate. And that is North America. God bless us. Um, maybe because everything is too easy. Uh, maybe because everything is too guarded. But we are also, we have also developed disaster kits, like I said, which is a sun bucket, uh, a solar flashlight, and radio um, that are so, that are, that are sold to individual households, as well as we're trying to work with FEMA and various uh, government bodies in order to store these kits for disaster preparedness to, um, it, so that, God forbid, in the time of natural and human-made disaster, uh, some buckets can be distributed. 
the reason that's critical is my own background is in disaster relief um, and policy planning. I, in 2010, the Haiti earthquake happened, and I remember very, very clearly the conversations that were happening between whether or not to give victims of the, the earthquake uh, nutritional bars or the traditional rice and beans. While of course, psychologically, being a, people being able to cook in community um, was pushing us to rice and beans, they had no way to, to actually cook Hi. it. Sorry, Avanda, sorry to interrupt. We're a bit uh, behind the schedule. I think there's lots of interest. Uh, okay, so let me go one more slide. Back eight. For Thirty seconds. And uh, um, it'd be great if you can look into the the, the chat, and then provide a, re a response on those um, questions. I mean, in particular, I think our audience interest in the cost, in the duration, um, etc., on the technical performance. So great. Uh, be great, great if you can you can type in because then everyone can see it and uh, take notes on those key parameters. Great, so just 30 seconds on the last slide, and then I'll be able to, to do that. If you can keep going, one more. Ooh, sorry, apparently I don't know the, how many slides I have. Keep going. We're going to what's next. Keep going. One more. Nope, one more. Yeah, perfect. Okay, this is our expansion area currently for the, uh, it depends on, the price depends on the country. That's, that's uh, the truth. If, if you wanna understand the price for your specific country, please give, uh, give me an email at ahava at um, and we, I'm happy to be in conversation with regards to the price. In all honesty, the price in Uganda is not the price in the United States. We don't believe that it needs to be, and that is our business model. Um, in times of length of its lifespan, it is it, it is uh, it lasts for ten years. Some buckets itself has not been um, has not been around for ten years, so that is lab based testing, um, and so so I promised Yavai that I would. Uh, I would end here. I look forward to if there is a Q and A um, doing that. I will certainly look through the chat and again, ahava a h a v a at sunbuckets.com. And I look forward to speaking to all ninety one of you on a one on one basis about sunbuckets more. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for your patience, Yavai. I appreciate it. Thank you, ahava. So be good because your slide have some um, cost uh, uh, yeah. data. You can copy paste into the chat. People can uh, take a note, and yeah. then we can have a discussion if we have more more time. Sure. Uh, but I want to now I uh, want to invite uh, our discussants to to share their reflections. Uh, uh, first, I want to introduce uh, Paul Buti from Kenya. Paul is uh, um, in charge of renewable energy development. His particular. Uh, Clean cooking champion in Kenya. So, Paul. Uh, thank there? you very, thank you very much, Yabe. I hope you hear me. Yes. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Paul Mbuthi, as has been said, and I'm working with the Ministry of Energy, Kenya. First and foremost, let me appreciate uh, SMAP and uh, the World Bank team for organizing this very informative uh, event. I have learned a lot listening to the speakers and presenters who have been uh, presenting. Uh, in fact, some of the issues that I thought were serious challenges, I, I can still begin to see that there is a way out and we can be able to resolve some of these challenges. But let me first of all then uh, go to just highlight a few things uh, that I consider would be some of the other challenges and which uh, need to be addressed. And one of these is the very fact that uh, someone has raised it. Uh, solar cooking is uh, outdoor based in, in our experiences. And we are happy that there is uh, innovative ways in which we can still uh, make that cooking to be done indoors. I think that is one of the challenges 
And then there is the challenge of, uh, of course, these devices are not uh, widely available in many areas. Like in our Kenyan side, uh, some years back, there used to be quite robust activities on solar cooking. But in the recent times, I think there has been a slowdown. And I think this is a time we need to work with partners and ask ourselves, how can we increase the visibility of solar cooking? Because I do recall years back, we were already doing a lot. We used to have national energy conferences and exhibitions. And during those exhibitions, we were able to demonstrate the use of solar cooking. And so, so for me, this is an area where we need to revitalize. Now, the other thing that I think is important is the informational barriers. People still do not know about uh, the, the technologies and the ability of the technologies to indeed cook. And this is an area where we still need to work in terms of how do we increase awareness? How do we address education of the public and consumers? The other bit is the policy barriers. Uh, in, in our national energy policy of uh, 2018, the policy has not explicitly spoken about solar cooking. Now, you will agree with me that when the policy doesn't mention uh, clearly these very important aspects, then the, the drive to get these things going, because the decision making is often at the level where people do not have adequate technical knowledge on these things. And so we feel, and I feel, that we need to get more policy attention to solar cooking just like now we have raised some profile on electric cooking. So as we speak about the broader electric cooking, we also then need to also zero into the solar cooking because these resources are available and can be scaled up if we really get things right. Thanks to the group that is talking about the sun bucket, I think that is quite innovative. And I feel this is something that uh, Going forward, I will need to engage with them. Uh, of course, I learned that quite some work has been done in the Kenyan side, in particularly in the, the, the refugee camps. And this is where we are saying, we need now to mainstream this and be able to scale. Uh, and, and I think we'll be talking about it. The last point that I wanted to say is uh, the issue of regulatory barriers and the issue of performance data. Because sometimes making decisions, you need to have a clear performance data that you can really use to convince decision making that indeed the parameters for performance are to this extent, and therefore you make it easier for the policy makers and decision makers to buy the idea. And so I feel this is an area where uh, I think SMAP could uh, uh, try to accelerate their involvement in this. We are also ready from the policy side, as well as uh, also mobilizing uh, partners so that we can make this a reality and we can scale this up. So I think for me, it's been a pleasure listening and I feel this is the right way to go. We are happy to partner in this we are happy to be associated. Thank you and back to you, Yabeng. Thank you very much, Paul. We we hear the right points, right? In order to move forward. So right now it's, it's just the first presentation, okay? To learn a bit about these technologies. But really, if we think about from the policy makers perspective, we need more of the performance data, um, the on the ground experience and let more policy makers to understand there are such technologies available and whether it's applicable to my country and uh, what is the cost associated with it and what are the needed regulatory or policy support. So right now we do see not many clean cooking strategy or national policy mention solar cooking. I think that's a lack of awareness. It's, it's one of the barriers we, the poll have highlighted. Now I want to uh, introduce uh, Steve, Stephen um, Behinda. Be Behinda. Sorry. Stephen is the renewable 
Energy Senior Energy uh, Engineer of Rwanda Ministry of Infrastructure. So, Stephen, please share your uh, reactions to the presentation and your perspectives on some of the key. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I want to appreciate the presenters. Uh, I think they have uh, gone some distance in addressing uh, most of the, I would say, maybe misconceptions or uh, ne negative feeling we have uh, against uh, cooking with solar. And in reality, cooking with solar, in truth, is a great opportunity that can help address most of the challenges that we have uh, in, on the energy demand side for, for Rwandan community, especially considering that uh, a recent survey highlighted that at least in a week, Kigali, however small it is, we need at least to cut down over 400 hectares every week of trees just to meet the energy demand of people in Kigali City. Uh, but but the, the truth of the matter is uh, we have a reservation in regards to solar cooking, including uh, imperfection associated with the uh, uh, the limitation of solar cooking. Uh, I've seen that uh, Gabia has highlighted that uh, some of these have been have been mitigated at an institutional level. However, at a household level, we still have challenges. Uh, a few years ago, I think one year ago, two years ago, when we had a seminar in Rwanda for sol for cooking, uh, we had one presenter who was uh, presenting a technology for cooking with solar. And one of the challenges that were highlighted were the limitation associated with energy storage. Uh, most of the communities, especially those communities that are probably able to afford cooking with solar, uh, will probably need to be cooking in hours whereby sun is not, the sun is not available. So, I, and I think uh, addressing that issue, especially for the storage of the heat and being able to cook with solar is uh, critical. Another highlight of the technologies that we were receiving here in Rwanda back then was that uh, they were taking too long to cook a meal. So a meal that would probably be cooked in, uh, in 30 minutes would probably go with an hour and a half, two hours. Yeah, so that was one of the challenges that we were facing back then. And I'm not sure uh, this has been uh, cleared from the presentation we've made. However, in some of the recommendations that I'll be giving in regards to how to move forward, uh, it will be uh, highlighted. And I think my colleague, uh, Paul Mbuti from Kenya has already mentioned piloting, uh, testing these technologies to basically avert any reservations that communities have in regards to solar cooking, even those that are considering uh, adopting this technology. Uh, another challenge that, has, that uh, comes along with that, the limited availability of the sun during the hours, especially from these communities that work nine to five, seven to five, uh, uh, is that then there will need to be some sort of fuel stacking or adoption of alternative cooking solutions to ensure that uh, the need for using solar technologies for cooking does not hamper the ability to have, to have meals ready at the time they need them or on time. In addition, of course, which has already been presented is the space. Uh, the space required for cooking with solar, it, it seems to me that it requires a huge infrastructure, apart from it being maybe cooking from outside. If you, you try to bring it indoors, uh, you will probably need a significant infrastructure to be able to uh, have this technology properly working for, uh, for our communities and use them for cooking. Uh, of course, other issues include, uh, of course, will include, of course, ensuring that uh, the users have appropriate technologies. Uh, some of these technologies need probably to be moving the, the, the heat collectors to ensure that you optimize the uh, capturing of the, basically the radiation collectors optimize the collection of radiation coming to these locations. So I think uh, significant training needs to be given to these communities that Boothy has highlighted that is also similar here to Rwanda is that we have no players or technologies readily available on the market. So significant efforts need to be put into basically uh, attracting uh, players on the market to ensure that at least uh, people start thinking about using these technologies. And uh, when the technologies are used, uh, one of the best ways of uh, training 
uh, communities or creating awareness in technology usage is of course uh, first users going out to highlight how they've benefited from these technologies. So this is very critical. Now, uh, next steps, of course, uh, uh, as uh, my, our colleagues also so far have highlighted, I think the first one is investment in technology development and research, and as well as proof of concept. So that is very critical. And I would like to invite uh, players in the solar sector to come. And of course, uh, we are a very open market where everything is quite pretty set up. And I think um, it would be a very good uh, area to begin to highlight the benefits of cooking with solar, as well as improving the technologies that I use. In cooking with solar. Um, of course, uh, of course, uh, one of the things that we've seen so far, I've seen already people are making calculations, participants are making calculations on the cost of the systems, and I think uh, further research would help, ben, will help uh, alleviate the issue associated with the cost of the system, because it's still pretty very high, and, and I think further research, uh, developing of innovative technologies would help ensure that uh, we have uh, affordable systems down the road that are, can be used by our communities. And then of course, they will still have an issue of standards. Uh, I don't, in Rwanda, I don't think we have any standards already in place to help, of course, uh, support the market as well as uh, protect the consumers, as well as uh, create that confidence in producers. I think uh, that is something that uh, uh, this forum, should, we should be looking at uh, developing at the moment. And then, of course, uh, I've already highlighted uh, awareness and marketing of these systems. And then, of course, uh, and finally, uh, finally, I just want to repeat it. Uh, I would really uh, recommend also part of this forum to come up. We have already tried this uh, innovative financing mechanism from the, for the private sector as well as the consumers. But I think it's also critical that we develop similar uh, programs for cooking with solar. Uh, it's uh, to address uh, the affordability issues that are inherent in cooking with soil as well as cost cutting or other subsectors for cooking. So thank you very much. A number of very good uh, suggestions into moving forward, right? For, for example, uh, have some pilot, piloting, piloting in a particular country context because that um, how you also mentioned that uh, each country are different. Okay, piloting, training, get on the ground experience at small scale, but have that on the ground experience with data evidence to support. It can help to um, let more people know and uh, continue to improve. And I also want to echo uh, Stevens' um, welcome of, uh, to like for the interest uh, solar manufacturers or entities to try to uh, try your product in Rwanda or other countries. So, I mean, we're banned. We have a few country engagements, um, like Kenya, Rwanda. Right now we are having a results-based financing program in Rwanda, provide uh, uh, results-based subsidies to help consumers to fill in their affordability gap. And for that, we also have a, a innovation grant that provide additional opportunities, I think, for innovators, for um, enterprises to, to test the market in uh, Rwanda. And we also have other countries like in Mozambique, Niger, we recently also have uh, projects approved. So there are also other opportunities. So um, now I want to uh, invite my colleague, Kenta, who is a testing leader in Africa region and to share his perspective on solar cooking or reaction to the presentation. Kenta. Hi, uh, everyone, thank you. Uh, can you hear me clear? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I, I have to say, I, I learned quite a lot. I, before joining this, I really knew very little about the solar cooking. I, I think I knew a little bit about the clean cooking on based on the biomass electric cookings. I think I knew a bit about off grid uh, solar products, which we are very much trying to support in the various countries. But solar cooking, it, it's some, something in between or hybrid of both. And it's a space that we are 
I honestly didn't pay much attention before, but now I think I learned quite a lot. I was impressed with the both presentation. The first one, I was I saw a lot of potential, especially in the institutional cooking setting. And the second one, I I, I was very much addressed the sort of the question I had: how what you're gonna do in how do you make the solar cooking possible indoor and even without the sunshine and uh, I actually didn't think about this storage solution coming in, so that was actually very impressive as well. And so thank you, first of all. Um, I, from my point, I wanted to ask several questions. I, I will be quick in the interest of time. Uh, the first one is on the affordability, which I think a lot of questions has been already raised in the chat. I, in the off-grid solar space, if you look at it, the way a lot of the businesses have been trying to address this is through the pay-go system. To make it to make it uh, make the payment structure aligned with their income or revenue flows instead of requiring a big upfront payment at the very beginning, which I believe that some bucket is also doing. But the question I had was in this in this solar cooking context, how does a pay go work in terms of assuring the payment coming through? And in the solar of quick products, typically what you do is you have the mobile connection, and if the payment doesn't go through, you basically cut out the system and uh, you don't have the service. Are you having something similar, or is there alternative approach for this uh, solar cooking? That's the question one. Um, the second question is, um, this again probably goes to the sum bucket, but also I'm curious to learn from the first speaker uh, as well. I, what are the priority customer segments or user segments that you're looking at in particular and in other words what are you trying to replace you know in the baseline cooking technologies are different some use wood some use charcoal some maybe using lpg or electric cooking some are urban some are rural and uh, in general we found it difficult to work uh, to address the rural market compared to the urban market, just because it's more difficult to reach. And uh, there tends to be more availability, not always, but availability of the free fuels, which so that the, there's a less expenditure that you're replacing. So I wanted to understand in res your respective products, what you can, what are the, what are the customer segments that you're looking at uh, as a priority and what can you realistically uh, expect to replace? And, you, 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 you're certainly aware that in this cooking space, there's a lot of stacking where you people buy new stove or cooking appliance, but they'll keep using the existing one. So I maybe you can also uh, come in on this as well. So that's the second question. And the third one is a kind of more generic one. And uh, because we are also the World Bank, a public organization which finances a government program. So do you see any Think anything that you'd like to see from the governments that you're operating, because that translates into what the government can do and what the world bank can do. Thank you. Thank you, Kenta. Excellent questions. Now, maybe I want to uh, ask Deepak first. So your uh, response to Kenta's questions on in terms of how, what, what type of consumer segment you're, you're looking at? How do you say consumer can pay for solar cooking, to talk about the productive use, income generation, maybe sure. from that angle. And then also what uh, kind of government policies you're looking at to support this sector? Uh, well, uh, it's, uh, I'm not married to any one particular technology. I think uh, that you will have to offer different solutions to different target groups. Uh, but of course, uh, I would love the smaller cookers, the decentralized technology, because it directly helps people to get power in their own hand and they can use it the way they want and when they want. But the problem of affordability. And initially there was a support, government support subsidy, which because of which a lot of people could buy. Now there is no government subsidy and that's why because of that, uh, that it's gone out of the hand. And the mistake government made was that a uh, few years back, they decided to give every uh, poor family uh, LPG uh, cylinder for cooking. So all those people who are looking at uh, buying a solar cooker, they stop because now the government is giving them free gas for cooking and <laughs> that has set us back. Uh, so uh, I think uh, income generation and microfinance is one solution by which we can really, uh, but it will depend on the area where you are. You have to really understand people's 
uh, tradition, culture, food habit, items that could be made. So it's not about technology, it's about social engineering. We need to understand for each and every community uh, their uh, specific solution. It, it's not going to be a same solution for everywhere, you know. Uh, the other solution which I perhaps uh, am working on and want to work uh, is a centralized cooking system, just like uh, in big cities or world over people are government is supplying pipe gas to each and every household and people pay for what they use. In the same way, I want to have a centralized system uh, or the boot model, which is called build, own, operate and transfer. And then it is supplying them a, a heat into the house for cooking, for air conditioning, for boiling water for drinking, for ironing, for dehydration. <coughs> And they pay for the energy they use, just like we pay, we have electrical meters, there would be energy meters. So these are all models which one need to explore. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's uh, One interesting point is about the government policy, when you subsidize, subsidize certain technologies, it will hurt other technologies. So, so that's something that I think that uh, we all need to, to, to be aware about it. Right? Well, on one hand, probably the policymaker need to be more strategic, uh, thinking, okay, what would be the, the country based on the, the endowment uh, comparative advantages, what industry want to promote. <coughs> but on the other hand, that beware not to uh, too early <laughs> to kill some uh, promising technology or sectors. Uh, that's why that uh, from SMAP Clean Cooking Fund perspective, we really focus on uh, performance, not pre-decide, pre-prescribe technologies, because each country are different. So uh, just to try to pave a um, level playing field and let market market to decide. So that's one, one aspect. And it's also based on our uh, lessons learned. But I think uh, on, on this uh, webinar and uh, from Deepak, response it's some resonate <laughs> such uh, um, consideration so uh, now I want to turn to uh, uh, Ahava regarding um, the question from Kenta on the business model how you pay as you go how does it work sure um, what we have found again is some buckets replaces fire when it comes to cooking but our our Kenyan team made us realize oh, uh, early on it doesn't replace lighting um, and we couldn't actually have people just cooking in the dark and if they're not going to actually collect that firewood or use lpg then they're going to be in the dark so the so the pay-as-you-go system is connected to the lighting you're absolutely correct if they didn't pay their bill they could still use the solar cooker but their house would be dark um, so they're they're interconnected there um, I do want to say, Kenta also made a really important point that uh, two really important points. One is with regards to um, we at Zen Buckets believe, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, shocking to the system of a family. If there is a capacity to transition it more and more to solar while relying less and less on dirty fuels, that's great. We don't, we don't need them to, to, you know, um, one day just all completely, uh, transform again, just looking at my model, right? If I were to, and if, and I've done this for 2 years, but if I, if, if I were frazzled in the morning and something wasn't working, it's nice to have a backup. And I put in the chat, we were, um, years ago, we were approached, but I mean, we've only, we're only about 5 years old, but about. Two, three years ago, we were approached by Schneider Electric to integrate a, an electrical backup into it. Um, the, the conversations went dead from their end, but that's something we're very interested in doing because we think, again, having options that are um, orienting more and more towards um, reducing deforestation and increasing um, environmental and health safety it is the most important thing. So it doesn't have to be shocking to the system. And the last point I wanted to say for Kenta's point about the rural market, it's a very, very, very important one. Um, we base, at least in certain countries, I'll take Uganda, for example, it's based on, it's still based on a tribal system. 
Um, and as a result, we, we sell in teams, in teams of about seven, and we uh, anticipate even though they themselves are living, the, the sales teams could be living in the, in the urban centers, um, they're anyway going to go back and visit families and, and their communities, and they're going to be selling, they're going to be, um, they're going to be uh, bringing the product to back to their families and back to their communities and back to their their tribes, um, and so the tribal system is very uh, is very much ingrained within what we're doing in Uganda. And again, I should know more by the end of this quarter in terms of how well that's working and it, what to what degree, um, and have real data in terms of how much of our sales are going to the urban uh, the urban areas and how much are going to the rural areas. So. Um, I would say, you know, let's check in in 3 months and I could actually give you practical information on that, which is a lot better than hypothetical. Thank you. I also see a long question about uh, whether solar can be captured to for uh, for induction stones for. So for this webinar, we have focused on the solar thermal cooking and not talk much about solar electric cooking. But I wonder if anyone from uh, um, uh, um because they have come out with a package of some solar PV uh, panel to induction stove and the light, basically a package of household energy that the powered by solar. Um, if, if anyone from uh, um, Petico, Pesito uh, can raise your hand and come in. But if not, that we can organize some uh, additional um, webinar to talk about uh, other solar electric uh, technologies. We yeah, still okay. have. Uh, uh, anyone want to come in? Yes, could I, could I comment about that, Yabe? Yes, yes. So, one thing that's important is the cost of PV is coming down. Um, and so, using electricity for cooking can make some sense. But because in many cases, for example, cooking at night, you need to store the energy from a thermodynamic and economic standpoint, it's much more efficient to store energy as heat and use the heat to cook than to store the energy in a in a chemical battery, as you would with electrical, pure electrical cooking. And so if you have surplus energy coming from a PV system, you can certainly use that for, for heating, whether it's with an induction stove or a hot plate or some other electrical heater. Um, but if you want to use it to cook when many people want to cook at night, then you could heat some, use that heat to then heat a sun bucket and use that essentially as a thermal battery to cook later on. So that's one thought about the heating. I have one other thought back to your question uh, from a minute ago and Kenta's question about government programs. I think there's an interesting opportunity that might be tested and maybe it has been, I'm just not aware of it, but the, the notion of pay as you go upstream of that, you could fund entrepreneurs. You could imagine women receiving funding to set up solar farms with, with arrays of, um, of parabolic dishes, and, and sun buckets or other thermal storage. And they essentially are charging these sun buckets and providing them on a pay as you go system for their customers. That would be some way to um, deal with that initial cost of the, of the system, the capital cost and provide the, su the sun buckets or other thermal storage on a pay as you go system for, for users. Um, and, have and you tried that? that? So Bruce, have Sorry? you tried? Because I heard that this kind of like a leasing model Quite interesting, but I wonder if you 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 tried at the community level. We have tried that. Um, we've tried it in the in the refugee camps where we've actually set up cooking centers. We've even even gone one step above that, where instead of having pay as you go for a, a charged sun bucket, where you get a hot sun bucket and then the next day you return the cold one and exchange it for a hot one, but we've even done cooking where people might drop off food and then come back and get their cooked food later on. So it depends, as Ahava has continued to emphasize, it sort of depends on the culture of the community and the specific country. But I think there's a whole array of solutions there as governments consider what might be best that could be tailored uh, for, for particular uses. And that reminds me that I had a brief answer to Kinta's other question about 
how do you ensure payment on a pay-as-you-go system? And with some buckets, it's just, if you use the sun bucket, you can't heat it yourself. You need to be, bring it back to the charging station. So you have to bring the cold one back and you don't get another one until you pay for it. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen, I see you raise your hand. Please come in. Yes, thanks. And uh, lots of questions I wanna address, but I know we're short on time, um, but thanks uh, Bruce for talking about thermal and how important that is uh, in terms of efficiency. I do also wanna mention there are hybrid cookers. So there are some solar thermal cookers that do have an electric backup. Um, so that's another option for people to be aware of. Um, and then something I wanna add in terms of the cost question is there are, as I showed in one of my first slides, different models with different costs associated. And so that can definitely be uh, another solution to the cost question is having some of those aspirational models. So starting with something, for example, like the cook it, uh, which can be made from recycled materials um, is a basic cooker. People can start to save money and time with that and become familiar with solar cooking technology and then become more familiar with um, other types of cookers that might cost a little bit more, but they'll have some savings from that as well. Um, but stove stacking is important um, in terms of solar cooking and uh, mix of technologies. And then in response to the, there was a point brought up about standards, um, and that's something that Solar Cookers International is working on through the ISO process. Um, international Organization of Standardization, making sure that solar cooking is included and how um, standards for stoves are developed. Um, we have the performance evaluation process or the PEP, and we actually have a testing uh, center in, at the University of Nairobi in Kenya. So um, definitely making that accessible there. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, probably, I, I think there are still questions way, way up, but when it comes to the end of the webinar, uh, I want to put this link um, Clean cooking community of practice. Um, I think that if people are interested, please join the group to have some continued discussions. This is just the first uh, uh, webinar on solo cooking that SMAP organized, but I'm sure there's a lot of uh, um, questions. We want to continue the discussion, especially, I mean, even uh, Caitlin, you remember I keep asking the, the questions, okay, where is this peer is? What are the costs? What are the challenges? How the customers response and the satisfaction rate and how one region may be different um, in another region. I mean, cooking is a essential activity, but it's such a diverse uh, context across the region, across the, the world. And there's many different challenges for solar cooking. I mean, as again, on one hand, we see all the good things about solar cooking, right? Um, it's, it's sun, shine, it's free. <laughs> Once you have that uh, device, once you get to use that, and you can, you can get a continuous, clean, free view. But on the other hand, um, this adoption is still very low. I mean, in the US, I do not see not many people use the solar cooking. I, and it's great to see that uh, Caitlin, you, your home, and, uh, um, I have uh, that you're using your own device. <laughs> so that's a way be good that we, once I ch have a chance to also try to learn to use that. And uh, because in the end, even for developed countries, if it's uh, carbon free, it's, if it's convenient, why not we switch to solar cooking? Um, so I think the discussion continue and the way we need to have more of a uh, experience in different countries, particularly on the costs, performance, business models, financing models, et cetera. But the, I do see the opportunities and the, the more countries are interested in clean cooking and the more financing is available. I mean, from the clean cooking farm side, we, we do provide uh, financing and we also want to share um, knowledge and to facilitate the knowledge exchanges. So please do um, continue to share and join our community of practice and share your experience, share your questions, <laughs> challenges, and so we can all uh, work together on this. Again, thank you very much for all our speakers and also our uh, discussions. I also want to uh, thank uh, our, my colleague, uh, uh, Jing Yi Wu, who coordinated uh, this webinar uh, through the, the process. Okay, thank you. Okay, have a good day. Thank you.